All right, guys. So, um, so we're going to start chapter one, which is sort of like introduction to um, a physics, a little bit of history, plus some extra information about, uh, let's say, sig figs, conversions, and things like that, uh, that you can also find in the lab handout. Uh, but also then second part uh, covers very important concept, and that's vectors. So scalars and vectors, technically. Uh, which is uh, very important to uh, understand because, for example, second hand, uh, second lab will be a handout, uh, you know, practicing liberal, you know, uh, on vectors. Uh, but it's important to understand vectors really well, understand how to work with them, and it's not easy to in, in the beginning because vectors are real, relatively abstract idea, and uh, vector addition when you have like adding vectors together. It's not as straightforward as it might seem in the beginning. So, but hopefully with some practice and everything, you will be able to, you know, um, get better and eventually, you know, handle any type of vector calculations. All right, so I talked about this physics a little bit already uh, in class, but remember one of the things we have here is the physics is an experimental science. And it's one of the most fundamental, you know, sciences as well, because one of the oldest one. Um, and it kind of tries to describe everything around you, starting from how the planets move to how, you know, objects move around you to all the way down to subatomic particles, how they are moving. And you can see, right, so technically then any major um, requires to take physics, engineering, biology, chemistry, uh, geology. That's because in every field there are, you know, uh, examples of, you know, like physics applications. So that's why, um, for example, there's a biophysics right now, a branch of biology and physics combined, or uh, physical chemistry, or let's say um, geophysics and astrophysics, something like that. Because physics is so integrated into all of those sciences and such a fundamental science that if you wanna study, let's say, physical application of biology, then you go into biophysics. All right. so. One thing we have here is physics, you can think of, can be uh, broke down into um, two branches. Or like, let's say uh, we have what we call classical physics and modern physics. So the classical physics is technically anything pre-1900, okay? Which is Newtonian mechanics, electromagnetism, optics, thermodynamics, and they are, you know, everything, all of those concepts, right, have been developed um, over four or 500 years, but before 1900. So we can see that some of the, uh, let's say, pioneers of the classical physics, uh, examples are Galileo, Kepler, Isaac Newton. So those, you know, uh, those you can see, right? Those, they, they lived in 1500s, 1600s. So that means, you know, we have about, you know, three, 400 years of history where the classical physics was developing. And we have now electromagnetism and thermodynamics is a little bit more modern phenomenal, a little bit like necessarily not a modern physics, but more modern compared to, let's say, uh, laws of motion, for example. So, but we have, for example, James Maxwell in uh, late 1800s and thermodynamics generally was also in mid or late 1800s was developed. So those things, but still, you know, they are considered to be classical physics. That means we will be studying mostly classical physics. In physics 66, um, pretty much everything is classical physics. In physics 67, we are gonna be doing classical physics for about two thirds of the semester. And only the very last chapters, last two chapters maybe, will be an example of modern physics. And that will be relativity and you know quantum physics. We will see it over here. So you can write modern physics which is at the end of 19th century. So we developed you know, a modern physics because some of the classical physics, let's say equations would break down when we would consider some you know, new, uh, let's say discoveries that were done in late 19th century. Uh, for example, the idea that light can move at the speed of light in vacuum and some objects, let's say, if they try to move at this, you know, uh, at the speed close to the speed of light, then classical mechanics cannot be used to describe 
how they would behave. That means their speed, for example, or their displacement or their time and um, let's say anything related to objects moving at the very fast speeds, you know, cannot be described with the classical physics. You need, you know, theory of relativity, which was um, developed by Isaac Newton, uh, sorry, Albert Einstein, And quantum mechanics was developed because uh, Max Planck um, was unable to uh, describe the behavior of light particles, the behavior of light, and it was discovered that light is actually has dual properties. Sometimes they can be a wave, sometimes, sometimes they can be a particle. And when you consider then all the way to subatomic particle size phenomenon, then again, classical mechanics breaks down. So then there was quantum mechanics developed to, you know, describes those subatomic phenomena. All right, so those two will be covered at the very end of physics 67. So sometimes we, you know, uh, we get a chance to actually go over them. Sometimes, you know, maybe quantum mechanics is not something we have time to go over, but still, those are the very last thing we cover in the sequence. All right, so you can see that in terms of two, a little bit, you know, breakdown with the theory of relativity, you can see, right, is in terms of the relativity, uh, theory of relativity was not something relatively new. That was uh, ideas of the relativity was developed even before Albert Einstein. But Albert Einstein was able to kind of combine several things together, which is, you know, a space, time, and energy, and describe how very fast moving objects, you know, behave completely differently. That means, for example, you, can, you guys heard of like this, you know, twin paradox and things like that. Those things are actually, you know, science fact and can only be described using the Einstein's theory of relativity. And quantum physics, right, provides description of physical phenomena at atomic level or even subatomic level. All right, so physics based on experimental observation and mathematical analysis, because physics is an experimental science. That means when you think of some kind of you know, when, or when you observe something, then if you try to like, let's say, explain that phenomena, you need to, you know, let's say, come up with some kind of explanation, but generally there are steps that you can, you have to follow. For example, you can come up with some kind of model. Um, it can be a very straightforward, very simple model, and then you can start developing maybe like hypothesis, and then hypothesis can, you know, give you uh, ability to come up with some kind of experiment to verify your hypothesis. And then what we have here is those, you know, let's say experiments can help you to, you know, verify if this is, let's say, correct, your hypothesis are correct or not, right? So the hypothesis gives you experimental, you know, let's say uh, way of verifying your, let's say your observations. And if you have verification, then it can technically become a theory. And if let's say then uh, experiments can be repeated in other, let's say um, maybe other, let's say uh, rooms at other cities and other planets even, or other, you know, let's say um, places where, you know, let's say the conditions are different then you might be able to see if this can be uh, changed to a law. That means any theory that can be verified in the experiment in different circumstances, right? In, under different conditions can actually become a law because law is more universal. That means it can, you know, it can be verified in under different circumstances. And we have some laws of physics that we will be considering. So you can see, right? You know, not everything can be a, you know, a example of fundamental law because you need a lot of different ways of verifying that in order for that to become one. All right, so since it's an experimental science, that means we need to do measurement, a lot of measurements. And one of the things we're gonna see here, there, there are technically some fundamental, uh, let's say units of measurements that we will be uh, using in this class. So that means anything that can be measured and calculated can technically be described with three fundamental units that we will be seeing 
in this class, Physics 66. And those three fundamentals, sometimes known as the standard fundamentals, right? Those are length, mass, and time, right? So what we have here is anything else, for example, velocity, acceleration, force, energy, those things then can actually describe with respect to these three measurements, length, mass, and time. So that's why those are known as the fundamental measurements, fundamental units. In physics 67, we're gonna also encounter electric charge, which is another fundamental unit, but you know, we're gonna have to wait until physics 67 to use that. But in any case, what, one thing we have here is, you know, you can see, right, length, mass, and time. Those are the three fundamental, you know, uh, measurements, three fundamental units that we will be using. For example, let's take length. One thing we have here is this. So let's say we have a group that will be working together to measure length of something. And one thing we have here is this. There are a number of options. You can measure the, the length in centimeters, meters, inches, feet, yards, right? Kilometers, astronomical units, and things like that. That means you have different ways that you can, different units that you can use for the measurements of length, even different systems. So in order for the group not to be, you know, fighting with each other, not for there not to be any type of confusion, we are adapting one measuring system. Okay, so this is known as SI units or the system international. That means this is also, you know, same as metric system, basically. That means all the measurements are going to be using the SI units of the, let's say, length, mass, and time. And SI units for the length is always gonna be then meters. That means there will be no disagreement with anyone. If you were doing a measurement of length, should be in meters. If you're doing, let's say then measurements of time, should be in seconds. Measurements of mass should be in kilograms. That means we are adapting this, you know, this system, right? This, you know, basically a metric system in order for us to have consistency in our you know, in our measurement. All right, so units of meters, generally not something that we use a lot in the United States. So let's say in uh, academia, in military actually, in, you know, in a lot of places, the units of meters as a length measurement is actually used, but not let's say in everyday life, right? You, when you drive from one place to another, those are in miles and, you know, things like that, right? So mostly, um, you know, we're using miles for that and, you know, small measurements, you know, usually in inches and things like that. You go to a store, they, you know, ask you to buy something. They're asking you what, you know, what is the, you know, inch or something like that that you want, what is the length. Generally, you know, it's a British system that we use in the United States. But, you know, what we're going to do here, we're going to try to then have some kind of, you know, understanding, for example, what measurements of length in meters might represent. So, um, for example, let's say, uh, the human size, right? So let's say um, adult human size generally goes anywhere between 1.5 meters to about two meters. So 1.5 meters to roughly two meters. <clears throat> that means whenever, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever you have a problem and you need to calculate, let's say the length of a, uh, of a human, uh, at least you know what more or less to expect, right? Uh, let's say, if you get 10,000 meters, obviously, you know, you're not gonna, you know, you're not never gonna find a person at that height. That means, you know, you did, you did something wrong, some kind of conversion problem or something like that. So you wanna have some kind of idea. For example, length of a football field is about 9.1 times 10 to the one meters, which is about, you know, 100 meters, okay? So roughly about 100 meters. And, you know, length of a textbook is 2.8 times 10 to the negative one. So uh, length of the house fly, five times 10 to the negative three, and so on and so forth. That means obviously I don't expect you to remember any of this, but you can see, right? Sort of like, let's say you can go as small as the diameter of a proton, uh, which is 10 to the negative 15, or as large as, let's say, um, close to the, you know, sort of like, let's say distance from earth to the most remote quasar, which is 1.4 times 10 to the negative, 10 to the 26. Obviously nobody can visualize what that distance is, or even, you know, anything like this, we can't really visualize that. But maybe, you know, somewhere here, that range is something we can, you know, more or less visualize, right? House fly, you know, like let's say, what is the size of the house fly? What is the size of, let's say, uh, 
a football field and so on and so forth. For the mass, then we have um, kilogram for the SI unit measurement. And the kilogram is basically used to be based on some kind of um, platinum cylinder in, uh, in France that was stored. And it was used as a reference for the, you know, let's say for the kilogram, one kilogram. It actually has been changed since last year and it's now based on a physics constant. So, but in any case, uh, let's say right now, one of the things you want to know here is this. What is the typical, you know, mass for a human? And that's 10 to the two, which is actually, you know, you know, kind of like too much a little, you know, let's say 100 kilogram is not necessarily, you can say the typical value of the, you know, adult human. So maybe, for example, I am about, you know, 70 kilograms. I would say maybe 50 to 100 kilogram. That will be like, let's say a good range rather than just, you know, uh, typically is like 100. So 50 to 100, it's a good range. So for example, then you have, you can see right, Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24, right? That one, five, uh, uh, you know, the Earth is much more massive. And actually that's a number we might, you know, use at some point. Let's say frog, roughly 10 to the negative one, mosquito, and so on. So that means um, more or less try to have an understanding, right? So let's say how to find, um, or how to you know uh, verify if the answer you got was correct. So let's say for the humans, that's a roughly you know what you should expect. If you're talking about a car, car is roughly you know 10 to the three kilograms. So that's kind of like the rough uh, value for the mass of the car, for example, and so on and so forth. So um, and obviously the time, the last you know of the fundamental or standard units of measurements. So, and it's gonna be, you know, seconds. So technically in any unit it is, you know, it is in seconds. So that means, you know, you have a few things that you might maybe uh, try to, uh, maybe rem remember or, you know, remember where to find. So for example, what is one year in, in seconds? What is one day in seconds? One, you know, you can see, right? One class period is three times 10 to the three, roughly about, you know, um, 3000, right? Uh, seconds and so on and so forth. So in any case, the, the units are basically uh, seconds for the for time. So we are using SI units, length in meters, mass in kilogram, and time in seconds. And then US customary system, length in foot, and mass in slug, and time is in seconds. If you thought that mass will be in weights, and weight is actually not a unit of mass. Weight is units of force in, you know, in US customary system or British system. So the weight is completely different thing, okay? Weight is actually equivalent to a Newton in a uh, SI unit. All right, so again, fundamental quantities, length, time, and mass. And there are everything else basically we can think of like our derived quantities. So quantities can be expressed as a mathematical combination of fundamental quantities. So for example, area product of two lengths, all right? So lengths are fundamental, area is a derived. Speed, a ratio of length to a time. That means if you go from point A to point B, you measure the length, which is a fundamental measurement, and then you measure the time, how long it takes to go from A to B. And take length over time, that's what the, you know, speed is. How fast you, you know, go from point A to point B. Then for example, you also have density which is mass per unit volume. Well, this is kilogram. This is, you know, cubic meters. You can see, right, again, it's, it's meters, kilograms, and seconds, and things like that. They all basically, so here, like meters per second, the units for the speed, they all in terms of those fundamental units. All right, so some of the things that you will see, and this is a very important table, a uh, lot of times the measurements will be uh, using prefixes or abbreviations. So for example, when you're writing 1000 meters, so this is basically can also be written as one times 10 to the three meters, All right? So that you're using power, you know, powers of 10. But then this 10 to the three is also can be written as K, you can see, right? 10 to the three is K for 
kilo. So that means it's kilometers. There you go. So km is kilometers. Or if you have 0 0.001 meters. Well, this is basically one times. So you go one, two, three, then times 10 to the negative three meters. And then 10 to the negative three, which is right here, it has a prefix of milli and abbreviation is M. That means M is the units of meters. The one before that, if written M, then this is actually the milli. That means this is one millimeters. Okay. That means, you know, this abbreviations always go before your actual unit. See the meters is a unit. K here is abbreviation. Meters is a unit. M here is abbreviation. So try to remember that. That means if, you know, the unit here, right, it comes after the abbreviation. We also can represent, um, let's say those demand, you know, the, the units, right, um, in what we call a dimension analysis. This is actually sort of like a tool, mathematical tool that will help us to figure out if the quantity that we're considering is correct, or if, for example, the equation that we are using is also correct. That means it's, is it basically uh, correct, what we call dimensionally? Is, there, is, it, is it dimensionally correct or not? So that's why it's a dimensional analysis. So what we do here is this. So for the dimensional analysis, we take, we take capital L for the length, capital T for the, uh, let's say, a time, and then we take M for the, for the mass. Okay. Now, what I have here is then, for example, area. Area here is, you know, length square. So we write it as length square like that, okay? Which is in SI unit is meter square, and in US, you know, US customer is feet square. Volume here is length cube, because it's length times length times length, right? Length times width times height, each one is a length measurement. So technically it's length times length times length, so length cube, and or cubic meters or cubic feet. Speed in terms of dimension, right, can be written as how fast you go through, you remember, from point A to point B. So then technically it's the distance covered between point A and B divided by time. So the distance is L, time is T. So that's a dimension analysis for the speed, L over T. Acceleration is L over T squared, for example, right? And so on and so forth. That means each derived quantity can be represented in terms of this, you know, dimension analysis. So for example, velocity here is L over T. Again, dimensions for area is L square. And then one thing we can do here is we can then look at some kind of equation, right? And use this dimension analysis to check if it's correct or not. Okay, so right? Technique to check the correctness of an equation or to assist in deriving equation. Dimension can be treated as algebraic quantities. Quantities can be added or subtracted only if they have the same dimensions. Remember this, this is for adding and subtracting. All right, so you cannot add two things that are not dimensionally, you know, identical. You can only add length and length, mass and mass. You cannot add length and mass, but you can actually multiply length and mass. All right, so length and mass can be multiplied, but you cannot add or subtract them. So that's why whenever you are looking at equation, you wanna look at it in terms of, let's say for when you have X plus Y, which is equals to Z, right? So for example, if the units for Z is mass, uh, sorry, M is meters, right? For example, then X and Y should also be meters because you can only add meters together to get another meters. That means you know that X and Y have, you know, they have to be units of meters. If this is in kilograms, right? Z is in kilogram, then X and Y should be also in kilogram. So then you, you can add them together, right? So for example, if I come back to this length, meters plus centimeters even doesn't work. You cannot add meters and centimeters. You cannot say, all right, so 10 meters plus 20 centimeters. You cannot do that, all right? So you need to, convert this guy into meters, which will be 10 meters plus 0.2 meters. So you get 10.2 meters. That is you know, allowed, but not 
10 plus 20 centimeters, 10 meters plus 20 centimeters. All right, so for example, you can also verify if the equation is correct or not. You have an equation where it says x equals one half a t squared. Now, you wanna see is that equation correct or not? Well, on the left side is x. So let's say on the left side is x. x is generally for the measurement. So we have units of length for x, all right? On the right side, you have this, you have one half, which is a constant. So technically in the dimension analysis, constants are not you know, included. But then you have basically acceleration times time squared. Well, acceleration has a unit of length per meter square, uh, per, per time squared. It's, it's basically meter per second squared. That's the unit for acceleration. So it's length over time squared. But then this is times t squared, which is then becomes t squared. And then from here, we can see, right, t squared, t squared cancels out. And when you multiply a times t squared, you get length as a unit. On this side is length. On the other side, oops, on the other side is length. That means, you know, you're good to go. They are correct dimensionally, right? So again, you can verify that because whatever you have on the left side, both of those quantities combined should be also the same thing that you have on the, on the left side. That means one is L over T square, the other one T square, and you can multiply two things that are not same dimensions. Uh, and you know, as long as the, the, the final unit, same as the one on the left side, you know, this is a correct equation. If this was, for example, A times T cubed, it would not have worked because in this case, you would have had L over T square for the acceleration and T cubed, for example, for the time, this would have canceled that, but then you would have had L times T. L times T doesn't equal, you know, doesn't match L on the left side. So this would have been wrong equation. All right, so same thing with the velocity. So it says velocity is L over T. And here's, for example, equation A times T. Is this also equals to the velocity? Well, L over T squared times T. This T cancels with that, so you have L over T. That means you can say V is equals to e A times T. That means velocity is equals to acceleration times time. And that's actually correct equation. We will be using this in you know, chapter two. So you can see, right, when units are not consistent, you may need to convert an appropriate ones. Units can be treated like algebraic quantities that can cancel each other. Always include units for every quantity. You can carry the units through the entire calculation. It's generally very good practice to include the units, even you know, in the middle of your equations or calculations. Because sometimes when you don't, you might forget what the units are. And when you include the units, you can see where they cancel out and what you end up having at the, at the end. So I highly recommend you guys always carry the units and try to you know, see where they cancel and what you end up with. All right, so I give you a couple of examples for the conversion. So you can see right here, I have example where one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. This is one of those you know, uh, conversion factors. So let's say then you have a 15 inch and I'm pretty sure all of you can do this, you know, conversion. I mean, this is, you know, a basic stuff, but still. So when you have 15 inch, you want to convert this to, uh, you know, centimeters, then you take 15 inch and use this conversion factor when you are presented by a ratio, you know, and then you basically write such a ratio that, you know, 2.54 over one. By the way, let's say if you ever wondered why, you know, you allowed to do this, is because when you have this, right, one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. See, for example, if I divide both sides by one inch, right, see on the right side, which I have 2.54 centimeters divided by one inch, it is equivalent to the left side, which is one inch over one inch. Well, one inch over one inch is equals to one. That means this ratio is equals to one. It's equals to unity. That's why when you take 15 inch and multiply two by one, you are in no way changing this quantity, right? Whatever this 15 inch represents, if you multiply that by one, 
it, it, it's in no way changes this quantity. But right now what we do here is because we want unit conversion, we just take one and just represent with this ratio because it is equivalent to one. But it, it allows us to cancel the units of inch and then take 15, represent that then in terms of centimeters. And that's what we get. So that's why you're allowed to do this because this ratio is known as a unity. It's equals to one. And any number multiplied by one, you know, doesn't change any of its properties. All right, so now we're kind of getting closer to, you know, uh, things that we need for the next several chapters, right? That means whenever you need to measure something, for example, a position. Well, if you want to measure position of an object, so let's say here's point A, right, this is that point of interest, All right? So what is the position of that point A? Well, how would we know? Unless we have a coordinate system. So then let's say, all right, so then I have a coordinate system. Here's my X. Now, what is the position of that A? Again, you know, I don't know what is the position of that A is unless I have a fixed a reference point. Well, then once I put the fixed reference point, I'm getting closer in being able to identify the position of that A. Because for example, if I take the you know, reference point, which we usually call X equals zero, right? The origin. Then I have one, one thing at least for sure is that X anywhere to the right of this origin is positive and X anywhere to the left of the origin is negative. That means one thing I know is at least that position A, right? So let's say you know, put like in terms of X of that position A is some kind of positive number. Now, let's say then I say, all right, so then this X is in, uh, me measured in meters. Then every mark is basically one meter apart. Then I can say, now I can say that this X of A is three meters because this is three marks from the, to the right of this origin. That means this X of A is three meters. All right, now you can make the def definite, you know, uh, let's say uh, record it as a, you know, as a position um, with definite answer. Otherwise, you know, you need, you, you wouldn't know until you have a reference point, okay? Because for example, if I would have chosen a reference point to be here, right? And then this position is no longer three meters. This is now one, two, three, four, four marks or four meters to the left of the origin. Then this becomes negative four meters. You can see, right? How easy it is to have a different position, even though let's say position of the object didn't change, but let's say actual physical, but it just, my reference point changed. And if the reference point changes, then you know, to record that value of the position of A can actually change because that is relative to where my reference point is. Well, obviously we wanna always have a fixed reference point and not a moving one, otherwise it's gonna be very difficult for us to make some accurate measurements. All right, so we will be then using Cartesian coordinates. Obviously you are familiar with Cartesian coordinates. So we will be, on, you know, generally, the standard is to take to the right to be positive X, to the left to be negative X, up to be positive Y, and then down to be negative Y, right? So those are the, you know, the standard way of using the Cartesian coordinates. But one thing you will see is technically it is up to you. You can change this any way you want. Maybe my object is moving to the left. Well, I can take left to be my positive direction. Nothing wrong with that. Eventually you will get comfortable with all of that. But right now to get, you know, to get started, let's keep to the right as positive X and up as positive Y. Then whenever, let's say I have a point of interest, if it's not on the X axis or not on the Y axis, but somewhere, let's say, you know, has both horizontal and vertical position. And I can say, all right, it's one, two, three, four, five. So this is basically X of P. That means X position of P then one, two, three, then this is then Y position of P, and that's basically five comma three, and so on and so forth, right? So you can see that you can always represent the position in terms of its X and its Y coordinates. All right. But one thing we can do here is this. 
All right. So let's say here I have one, two, three, and then I have one, two, three, four, right? So that means I can say that position X of this point, let's say point P, is three meters. And then, let's say, right? And then vertical position of this point P here is four meters. All right. That means, for example, you can walk three meters in this direction, then you can walk four meters in that direction and get to that point P. Or, you know, you can walk four meters in the Y direction first and three meters in the X direction and you get, get to that point P. All right. Because we know that this is three meters and this is four meters. At the same time, one thing we can do here is this. If I want to go from point zero, the origin to that point P, I can also go in a straight line like that along that, this, along that length R, right? But let's say if I want to find then that information about that R and how the R is related to, let's say, my coordinate system, then we need to use polar coordinates, all right? We need to use them polar coordinates. And this is where you can see, right, we will be using combination of Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates to describe, you know, let's say position or position change or, you know, what we call displacements and things like that. All right. So let's say here R. And that's the length if you go from the origin to that point P in a straight line. Okay. If you go in a straight line, that means we have to go along that R. What is the, what is the information about that R? So how, how long is the R? What is the direction of that R relative to our coordinate system? Because I know direction of this is X direction, positive X direction. Direction of this is positive Y direction. Okay, but I don't know the direction of R. It's not straightforward, it's you know, somewhere between. But obviously using polar coordinates, we can get that information in terms of you know, length R and the theta angle for that R, right? So we can actually get that information and write this in terms of that R. Because if you go in a straight line from the origin, this distance R and this theta R in terms of like, let's say direction relative to the positive X axis, I will get to that point P again. Now, how we get that, you know, let's say, uh, how we relate all of these quantities. Well, hopefully you guys remember, right? So we can actually use a right triangle because you pretty much created a right triangle and using the X, Y, and R, where the X and Y are, you know, basically perpendicular to one another, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. You can see, right? X is equals to R cosine theta. Y is equals to R sine theta. That's because if you have a right triangle, sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. That means, you know, I can represent this as, you know, rewrite this, sorry, rewrite this as Y equals r times sine theta. That's what we get over there. Then cosine of theta is equals to adjacent over hypotenuse, x over r. Rearranging, we get that. Same thing, tangent of theta, then relates to y over x. And I can find r because r squared is equals to x squared plus y squared. Right? So those things are also related to one another. Right? That means remember, whenever I have, you know, something like this, right? I need to find the length, you know, uh, using polar coordinates, right? And the direction, we then actually use, need to use the polar coordinates, need to use, you know, this trig function. And remember one thing is that whenever you go counterclockwise from the positive x-axis, that's technically, you know, considered to be the positive direction, okay? That means, for example, this will be 30 degrees, positive 30 degrees because we're going counterclockwise relative to the positive x-axis. All right, now we're ready to tackle the scalar versus, you know, vector, these quantities. And these are very important because generally everything that we study can be described either as a scalar or a vector. So the scalars are the easy ones. Those are the quantities that can be described by some kind of number and a unit. For example, temperature, volume, mass, time, um, distance, right? Those all can be described by a number. Temperature, you say it's 30 degrees. 
it can also be negative. You can say it's negative 30 degrees. Volume, like 20 cubic meters, right? Mass, 10 kilograms, and so on and so forth. That means there is no need to include any type of direction. You don't say I'm like 70 kilograms north, right? So there's no such thing. But for example, then, vector quantity has to be described with some kind of number in a unit, which we call its magnitude or its size, and a direction. Because for example, let's say if you want to know, uh, let's say where the library is. So let's say you, you go and you ask somebody, where is the library? And they can say, all right, so the, or so how far away is the library? They can say, oh, here, library is about, you know, 100 meters from here. All right, so let's say this is you. And you're told that library is 100 meters from here. All right, that's fine. But then should you move in this direction, that direction, this direction? Which direction should you move 100 meters to get to the library? When you're told that library is 100 meters away, you are told the distance, which is a scalar quantity. Now, to tell you how to get to the library, I have to give you a vector quantity known as a displacement, right? So displacement then is a vector quantity because I can tell you go 100 meters heading, for example, east, right? Or in a positive x direction, then you will get to the library because any other direction 100 meters, you will never get to the library, right? So that's why the examples of vectors involves anything that has two quantities, kind of two physical, let's say, parts to that. That's the magnitude and direction. So it's two things, you know, coupled together. All right, so again, so this is basically what I was kind of mentioning. So when you're talking about uh, how to go from point A to point B, right? So let's say this is, you know, your house and that's the library, okay? Now you're told that library is a uh, certain distance away from that. But one of the things we have here is also this. Maybe, for example, a library, even though if you go in a straight line like this, it is 100 meters, but obviously probably there's a, you know, there are streets like this. So you have to go, you know, let's say like that, you have to go like this and then you have to go like that. So most likely the distance that it will take you to go from, you know, your house to the library using the streets and things like that will be more than 100 meters, okay? Now, distance then is basically how much overall, how many meters you travel to get to that point B. Again, you can go like this, you can go like that, you can, you know, whatever, go from A to B. And you can see, right, more you walk, bigger the distance. But then when you get to that point B, one thing you can find is that, all right, so what is the straight line distance from A to B? And that is known as a displacement, right? Which is basically, what is the, you know, like, let's say, straight line path, right, distance uh, from A to B and in which direction? That means, let's say this is 100 meters and in that particular direction, right, that particular direction. So it has two things. It has a size, 100 meters, and I can represent that with an arrow like this. And also it has, you know, basically it has a size, it has a direction. Okay, two things that we want. All right, so then, as I said, displacement is an example of a vector, okay? Example of a vector, because you cannot represent a quantity like displacement with just a number. You cannot represent qu quantity like velocity with just a number, because those things require both magnitude, its size, and the direction. Now, magnitude, of a vector, which is its size, is always a positive quantity. Okay, it's always a positive quantity. So here, for example, let's say, okay, let's say I'm using, by the way, one of the things I can also do here is this, let me do it over here. We talked about Cartesian coordinates, we talked about polar coordinates, but we can also represent, you know, let's say the coordinate system directions in terms of east, west, north, and south, right? So we can actually represent in terms of that. So, but 
<clears throat> in any case, so what I have here is, so let's say if you go from A to B, you go 100 meters. And let's say that direction here is, for example, if I take this direction to be positive direction, then I can say you move in a positive direction. But if you, let's say point B happen to be here, if you go from A to B like this, I will say you still go 100 meters. That means magnitude is still 100 meters, but now you go in a negative direction, okay? That means displacement itself is negative, but negative indicates in which direction you're moving. Because once you identify your standard positive direction, if your displacement, if your vector is negative, that means it's going in the opposite direction of your standardly chosen you know, positive direction. All right, so that's kind of you know, what we can have here. So let's say then you have your Cartesian coordinate system and then you identify your reference point and then you have some kind of position that you say, this is my starting point and usually given as X sub I, which is known as the initial position. Okay, so this is then initial position. Then let's say object goes from this initial position to some final position. We represent it as X final, All right? Then the displacement would be how far away you are right now compared to your starting point, All right? Which is then basically represented as delta X, which is change in X because you change the position, right? So this delta X is given as final X minus initial X, because it's a change in position, final minus initial. But also it's a vector because I can represent that displacement, that position change with an arrow. That arrow here, you can see, right, represents how far you moved, which is the length of this arrow and in which direction, which is to the right. Because you only have to move to the right that distance to get to that x final you move that distance to the left you're not getting to the x final position to indicate that this quantity is a vector we actually use an arrow like this okay this arrow is a notation on top of the delta x so don't confuse it let's say if you're going to the left then this delta x becomes like that no there's no such thing this arrow here is a notation and not an indication of which direction let's say you are moving So then we can generalize this and represent vector with some you know, general notation. That means any quantity there is a vector, we can use this letter A. Okay. That means if we're considering something there is a vector, it has magnitude, which we can represent either like this, which is the magnitude of that vector A, or just A without an arrow on top. So that's also, you know, can be, you can, uh, that's actually what I usually use. A, then I have a direction. So here's a direction, let's say. So magnitude of a vector, again, remember, is always a positive number. And what we can do then is always use an arrow to represent the, any type of vector. So you can see that here I have, you know, example of some arrows, and those are basically some vectors, okay, where their length is the magnitude and you have, you know, their direction. Now, there are some things we can do about vectors. So if you have two vectors that have the same direction and have the same length, then you can say that they are identical. They're equal to one another. For example, I can say, all right, this is vector A and this is vector B. But if both of them are pointing in the same direction, have the same length, I can say that they are basically equal to one another. Okay, so you have two, two vectors equal to one another. For example, if you have a vector A like this, but a vector B like that, that means I can say their magnitudes are the same, but as vectors, A is equal to negative of B, because you know, that negative indicates that they have opposite directions, right? So we can also you know, understand that direction represented with a negative and negative does nothing but indicate the direction. That means we're not gonna be taking, let's say, you know, some vector A is equals to, for example, negative three, uh, where negative represents the direction to the left compared to another vector A, which is positive three, which is indicate the direction to the right. 
So I'm not gonna say that one vector is you know, bigger than the other one or something like that. Because in mathematics, you take negative three as a number and compare it to positive three, well, this is a larger number. Well, in, 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 in physics, when you do talk about vectors, well, those are just two identically long vectors. It's just one pointing to the right, one pointing to the left, that's it. But in terms of their size, they're exactly same vectors, right? You're just pointing in the opposite directions. All right, so now there's some number of things we can do with vectors. For example, let's say if you have a vector like this, and let me kind of give you a scenario in terms of like, let's say displacement, because maybe it's easy to see. For example, this is X initial and this is X final. So let's say if you are moving from, you know, X initial to X final, and this is your vector, and let's, I'm, I'm gonna just use this as A. Is it, it's a displacement, let me, but let me use A. But let's say then after that, we decided to continue moving. And then we went from, let's say, now, let me do it like this. This is X1, this is X2. And let's say we want to this X3. All right. Then what I have here is then this is, you know, can be labeled as B, which is the second vector. That means we go from X1 to X2, and then from X2 to X3. All right. Now, one thing I can do here is I can now add those vectors together. I can do A plus B to find out, you know, what is my displacement from X1 to X3, All right? And let's say I can say this is equal to some vector R, and vector R is then this, you know, resultant vector going from X1 to X3. That means in this case, vector R will be sum of vector A and B, but vector sum. And vector sum can be very straightforward, you know, maybe if they are parallel vectors, but it can get complicated as vectors becomes, you know, let's say two dimensional, three dimensional, so on and so forth. So right now, for example, it's very straightforward for me to write this. So let's say if this is plus three, and this is, let's say, uh, plus four, maybe because it's a little bit longer, then vector r will be then um, you know three plus four only because those two vectors are on the same axis pointing in the same direction. So then three plus four equals seven, let's say units, right? And this is basically seven, and it's pointing in a positive direction, which is basically the direction as I would have if I go from x1 to x3. That means what we have here is this: there are a number of things we can do. We can calculate, right? And we can you know, use the graph. So for example, you can see that what I did here is technically I use the graphical method, even though this is you know, kind of parallel. But this is known as you know, tip to tail, or right? tail to tip, you know, doesn't matter. So what I did here is I, I have the A vector and I have the B vector connected such that tail of A, uh, sorry, tail of B is connected to the tip of A, right? So as you can see, right? B has its tail connecting to the tip of A, all right? And then this resultant vector goes from a tail of A to the tip of B, okay? So you can also see that, for example, over here. So here's my vector A and here's my vector B. And you can see, right? They are connected here, tip to tail. That's why the name is tip to tail. And what I have here, I usually like to put some numbers. So let's say this is zero, my starting point. And this is one, my point where A and B are you know, connected. And this is my point three, which is generally the last point. Okay, final point. Then the resultant vector, if I'm finding the resultant by adding A and B together, will always go from your starting point, which is from zero, to your last point, which is point three in this case. And that will be basically a line that connects zero and point three. And that will be how the graphically will vector R look like. Well, you can actually, you know, we're gonna see that you can calculate, what, for example, what is actual length? So what is the magnitude of vector R? And what is, for example, the direction of this vector R? But, you know, at least the graphical method gives you some information. For example, if I would graph this, I can see that this vector R is basically a vector in a first quadrant. And for example, if I have a you know, direction, 
for you know to estimate the direction, I probably would estimate this to be 30, 40 degrees. Okay, so then I can calculate and verify that later on. But at least you know the graphical method gives me a way of figuring out or approximately estimating the volume. You can have more than two vectors added together. So let's say you start from here, point zero, and then you go to point one, and then from point one to point two, then point three, and then point four. Then let's say if the point four is your last point, then the resultant vector is adding all of those vectors. You can see, right, they're all connected tip to tail. So this will be vector A plus vector B plus vector C plus vector D equals to vector R. And the graphically, it will be from your starting point where the A started to your final point where the B, uh, D ended, which is point four. So you connect from zero to four and that's your resultant vector. All right. We can also find the resultant vector using a different, uh, let's say, addition, or which is commutative, you know, law of addition. That means instead of doing A plus B, we can easily do B plus A. Because see over here I have A, then connect B to the A, and then the resultant. But I could have easily done B, then move the A so that connected to tip to tail, right? So that means this is my zero point, this is my point one, this is my point two. And then, then this is A, All right? So then let's say you can do it like that. That means, you know, A plus B is equals to, you know, B plus A. You can switch the order in which you are moving or adding vectors. There are some other properties that, you know, rarely get used technically. So we have associate property of addition, A plus, you know, quantity B plus C is equals to quantity A plus B, then plus C. That means you can just change around the order of, you know, how you add those vectors together, but at the end, you're gonna pretty much get the same thing anyways. You can also have a negative of a vector, which I already showed you, right? So negative of a vector is just the same vector, same length, but in opposite direction. So for example, if you have this vector A and you have another vector, which is basically if it's the same length, but in opposite direction, this, you can say this is negative A. So if you add them together, you should get zero because both of them have the same magnitude, but opposite direction. So one is negative, one is positive. When you add them together, you get zero, okay? Because for example, if you start from here, go, and then you then, let's say this is point one, and then come back here, and then this is your point two, then you can see, right? You have to draw a vector from zero to two, but you are basically coming to the same position. I just drew it like that so you can see that, you know, you're coming, you know, this is a different vector, but you're coming to the same position. That means if for a round trip, the resultant vector is always zero. Okay. We can also do a vector subtraction. That means A plus B equals B plus A. Right, so you can use a special case of a vector addition, A plus B equals B plus A. So um, for example, here we have, let's see what we're doing here. All right, so let's say you have vector A and you have vector B. Okay. Now, my vector B here is let's say this guy over here. This is my vector B. This is my, this is my vector A and that's my actual vector B. But instead of adding them together, which would have given me this resultant, right? This would have been the resultant of A plus B. I'm gonna actually subtract them, A minus B. Now, what, what do I get from that? Well, what I can get from this is this. I know how to work with addition of vectors, which is tip to tail method I can use. But you know, I can rearrange this equation to look like this. It's A plus negative of B. That means I'm adding two vectors, but I'm adding vector A and negative of vector B. That's why this is vector B, but what I do, I, I don't take this, I take the negative of vector B. This is the negative B. 
So when I use A, then tip to tail negative B, the resultant is again, so from point one, point zero, one and two. So then it goes from first one to the last one, which is right here. And this one is then A minus B actually, right? Because you know, A plus negative of B is actually A minus B. All right, so let's look at then some examples. All right, so the postal employee drives a delivery truck along the road as shown. Determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant displacement by drawing a scale diagram. And you can see, right? So here I have starting point. So we get 2.6 kilometer north and then four kilometers east. And then we go 3.1 kilometers, 45 degree relative to east. Generally, what we call this is northeast. See, if you go toward north from east, we call this northeast. So that you can say it's 45 degree northeast, or if we actually know it's 45 degree, we can just leave it as northeast because northeast just means exactly halfway between north and east, and that's what 45 degree represents. And if I have to then do the diagram, it will be going from here to all the way over there. That will be then my resultant vector, okay? That means my resultant vector will basically look exactly like that because that's A plus B plus C and vector R is going from point one, sorry, zero, one, two, three. Three is my last point, zero is my first point. I connect those two and that's my resultant. I can then put it in a coordinate system, maybe measure this using a ruler or a measuring device, I can get 7.4 kilometers and 38 degrees.